What if Naruto reborn as Lord Gremory in high school DXD? Before that subscribe to my channel for more content. Rias Gremory was staring at the paper in front of her with an unidentifiable gaze. When her bishop had delivered the news to her, she was not sure what to think. The redhead simply opted for asking the bearer of the report for insight. It appears that a student from our school has been killed, Kuroka. The one spoken to was Rias bishop, Kuroka Tuju. She was a beautiful woman with long black hair and a matching black kimono. Her hazel eyes were twinkling with mirth, as they often did, accompanied by her teasing smirk. Kuroka also had two black cat ears and two tails, signifying her Nekosho heritage. Baku, they killed Issei because they saw him as dangerous. Should we be worried, NYA? I don't see any reason to be. He did not give off any kind of energy. Because he died in our territory, NYA. Kuroka asked confusedly, aren't you worried that there are rogue fallen here? Rias just steeped her fingers and laid her chin in her hands. I have been aware of them for a long time, my cute servant. She smirked, I just needed to know where they were located, and now I do. Kuroka blinked. So, you used him as bait? No, I didn't know that Issei was even a target, but it worked out. My parents would be disappointed in me if I actively bartered in lives like that. Why did you not scout him for your peerage then? Kuroka tilted her head in confusion. And why would I? Rias argued back, I have no reason to scout members as of now. Papa has told me to concentrate on my studies and have fun. She said proudly with a happy smile. Him, that sounds, boring, NYA. Kuroka deadpanned as she stretched on the couch. Nya. Then she sat cross-legged and asked, I thought that you would be in an arranged marriage you hate, and the new servant would save you gallantly like in those anime you like. Kuroka teased with a cat-like grin. Shush shut up, Kuroka. Rias snapped with red cheeks, and for your information, I would be in a marriage contract right now if it weren't for Papa. She huffed. Oh, with whom? Rias Sama. A new voice asked, making the two look at the door. The one who had entered looked a lot like Kuroka, except for a shorter height and leaner build. She also had white hair instead of Kuroka's black. She was also wearing a Kuo Academy uniform like Rias. Cheyenne Chan. Kuroka cheered and glomped the shorter girl, give your big sister a hug, NYA. Cheyenne simply giggled and returned her embrace, making Kuroka's tails wag. Hi. Nei Chan. Kuroka moved her so that she was sitting in her big sister's lap and started playing with her fluffy white ears. Nei Chan, I'm 15, NYA. Stop that. She complained while trying not to purr. Kuroka paid her no mind and continued stroking her hair with a dopey grin. Cheyenne just sighed and turned to Rias. So, who would the contract have been with? Rias's good mood deflated instantly as she grimaced. Riser for Nex, she said with the most disgusted look she could muster. That asshole our sorry. Cheyenne winced as she was flicked on the ear with a cry of, language, from Kuroka. That idiot. What happened? Cheyenne was extremely interested to know how Rias dodged the cannonball. Rias gained a proud smirk. My father stopped it. She declared and raised her chin haughtily. The Phoenix had gone to him before I was born, to forge a union for the good of devil kind. She mocked while making air quotes. And then, Cheyenne asked, invested in the tale. HMPH. What else? Papa kicked him out the door. He said, my little girl will marry whoever she chooses, the good of devil kind does not take priority over her wishes. And when they tried to get political, he showed them who's boss. Rias pumped her fist in the air, eyes sparkling with pride. UWAA. Cheyenne clasped her hands with stars in her eyes, so cool. Right, right. Rias nodded her head fervently. Her father was indeed very cool. As expected of Otu-sama, Kuroka said happily, still petting Cheyenne's head. When she heard this, Rias gained a tick mark on her head. Don't call him that. He's my dad, not yours. She sniffed with supreme arrogance. Oya, is someone getting possessive? Kuroka teasingly jibed, making Rias flush, but he told us that he considers us his daughters, right Siron chan Hi. Nei chan Cheyenne nodded, making her short hair bob from the motion. He told me he loves me, that he'll always protect me, she trailed off with a beaming grin. It felt really good to know that someone loved you unconditionally and had your back always. Rias was shooting her a death glare, which Cheyenne ignored as she went into happy memory land. Kuroka also lost all sense of teasing and gained a soft smile on her lips. I still remember when he found us on the streets. He carried us home in his own two arms, fed us, cared for us, and loved us. She remembered fondly, I don't know where we would be without him, NYA. She looked Rias dead in the eye, with all the emotion a homeless, scared girl could have, if that's not a father, I don't know what is. After hearing those words from the heart, Rias Blair lost all heat. 
she just settled for pouting adorably at the cat sisters. Why did her father have the habit of adopting every lonely kid he came across? Her position as his little girl was in danger. She then scoffed to herself. Who was she kidding? Her father would always love her, without a doubt. He loved their whole family deeply, and his taking in children in need was one reason he was the best dad in the world. She could make do with a couple of adorable siblings if she had such an awesome dad. Ara Ara, are we talking about Gremori Sama? Rhea stiffened as she looked at her queen, who had entered. Akano Himejima had the most innocent smile plastered on her face, a smile which screamed danger to anyone who knew her. I also owe my life to him, Baku. Akano tilted her head, he is the reason my mother is alive, and I am on good terms with my father, after all. Akano also had many good memories of Rhea's father. He was the one who found us in time to save my mother and me, and he is very important to all of us. She then smirked at Rias, whose pout had only increased. You Fufu, is Baku jealous? Ara Ara, you're such a daddy's girl, Rias. She cupped her cheek with her palm and swayed slightly. Moo, Rias's cuteness was reaching critical levels, where she would probably have killed a lower ranking being with sheer mo. She huffed in embarrassment, crossing her arms with a cute pout. Seeing her plight, Akano decided to change her subject. What's this about a student dying? Rias showed her the paper and told her the plan to deal with the fallen. Have you contacted Azazel Sama, Rias? The Alliance will want to know about this. I have, but they are rogues anyway. We have the all clear to wipe them out. Rias said, even though the supernatural world was in a golden age of peace, such conflicts and rogue cells popped up from time to time. All right then, we shall deal with them. Akano nodded, where are Yuto and Gaspar? Shion piped up, still in Kuroka's lap. Oh, they're sparring, NYA. Gaspi needs to fight without relying on his sacred gear, so he is learning Kenjutsu. Understood. Call them up. We move tonight. So, please work with us on this, the Alliance has decreed as such. Rias and her peerage looked at the two exorcists that were seated in the orc room, Irina and Zenevia, along with a nun. They were here to retrieve stolen Excalibur fragments, which were stolen by the fallen angel Kokobiel. The man had been branded a traitor by the Alliance but had fled before being tried for his crimes. Rias looked at her knight, who was standing beside her with a blank look on his face. It must be difficult for him, with his history with the Excalibur. She was about to ask him to leave, when. I agree, Baku. Let us do the needful. He said seriously, surprising Rias. Are you sure, Yuto? Rias asked hesitantly, with your his. I need this, Rias Sama. He cut her off. I have realized that revenge is not the answer, and I need closure. He clenched his fist and stared at her with resolve. Dad must have spoken to him sometime. He's really matured. She mused. All right, as you say. Hakano pointed at the small nun sitting next to Irina. Hanno, who is that? The nun jerked upright in shock and poked her fingers together shyly. Ah, ah apologies. My name is Asia Argento. I am here as support for my friends and to heal them if they get hurt. She blushed brightly when Irina patted her on the head. Asia has the twilight healing sacred gear, which is vital for a mission like this one. Zenevia said, making Rias nod in understanding. Kuroka had a question, however. You would even heal us, NYA. An unwilling to heal a devil. Now she'd seen everything. Asia nodded fiercely, determination in her eyes. Of course. We are all allied now, it is natural. Since the three factions were in a formal alliance, such joint operations were pretty commonplace. Rias decided to steer the conversation back to the topic. Anyway, let us plan a course of action. How convenient for both devil heiresses to be in one place. I shall slay you with haste. Kokobiel cackled maliciously as he stared at the group of damned devils with all the hatred he could muster. Soon, the world will be bathed in the flames of war. Kokobiel was and always had been a warmonger. Peace among the supernaturals just didn't sit right with him. What was life without conflict and strife? The Gregory had gotten complacent under that fool Azazel, and they were dallying and making friends in the name of peace. Unacceptable. The Fallen were the strongest faction, and he would prove it. He would usher in a new age where they reigned supreme, and Kokobiel himself would lead them towards this glorious goal. Though I have to admit, you were stronger than I had expected. Not a match for me, of course, but still. He snarked arrogantly, looking at the corpses of Freed and Valpa. When he had initially thought that he'd win easily, it had not been so. The Citri girl's peerage was normal, but the Gremory girl's peerage had proven to be very meddlesome. The two cats were capable of senjutsu. The queen was able to use Barakil's holy lightning. The bishop was in possession of the forbidden Balor view, and the knight was a formidable swordsman with sword birth, which had even attained balance breaker. Even the redhead herself was proficient in the power of destruction. 
Kokobil had only been able to win by sacrificing both his underlings. But he had won, the pests were all on their last legs, and it would take but one attack to exterminate them. Rhea glared at him with intense hate while clutching her broken ribs. It's because we've been training extensively with our abilities. There are no shortcuts to being strong, she declared resolutely. Kokobil just laughed mockingly, and that is where you're wrong, girl. Power comes only to those blessed by fate, to those with talent. For however hard you might train, you still fell short of my might, he boasted. Akano limped towards Rias, just as injured. Luckily, due to Asia's help, there had been no casualties, but they were all pretty battered. I still don't understand why you told me not to contact your brother, Baku. Rias just looked away, clenching her fists. It's because I'm tired of being the princess or the damsel in distress, Akano. I am tired of always needing someone to save me. She screamed, making Akano's eyes widen, I wanted to prove that I can look after myself, that I can protect everyone on my own. She yelled angrily, with tears in her eyes. Akano looked at her king with concern and sadness. Rias. Their moment was interrupted by Kokobil. How foolish, he mocked, smirking maliciously, if you had called for assistance, you might have won. Your pride will be your downfall. He shouted as he summoned a large number of light spears. As the devils and exorcists looked on helplessly at their inevitable death, Rias glanced at the necklace she was wearing and gripped it with resolve. It was a keepsake given to her by her father, with a unique seal engraved into it. She remembered what he'd told her while giving her the charm. I know you want to prove yourself, but I'm your father, Yano. So don't be afraid to call me whenever you have no way out. I trust you, Rias. I know that you'll only use it after you've given it your best shot. I will always protect you, believe it. Smiling at the memory, Rias clutched the necklace tightly in her hand and channeled her magic into it, hoping desperately that she wasn't too late. Cheyenne watched in horror as the hail of spears descended onto them like a personification of death. Her life flashed before her eyes, and she found that she had no regrets. She had an awesome big sister and an amazing family with whom she had spent the past years happily. Cheyenne closed her eyes as she resigned herself to her fate, awaiting her death. When no such death came, she was surprised. She opened her eyes, only to be blinded by several rapid flashes of red. Cheyenne watched in shock as each spear was systematically destroyed by a corresponding flash. When the flashes of light died down, she was greeted with an unusual sight. There, standing in between Kokobil and the downed forms, was a single figure. The person had their back turned to them, but Cheyenne recognized him instantly. Not many people she knew had such deep crimson hair, after all. Otu Sama, it seemed that everyone else had also taken note of the newcomer and had various reactions. The exorcists and Sona's peerage straightened up in respect, Barsaji, who was new and didn't know the man. Kuroka, who had appeared at her sister's side to check on her, also had a happy smile at seeing the redhead. Hakano, Gasper, and Yuto sighed visibly in relief, a heavy burden off their shoulders. Rias had tears in her eyes as she clutched her necklace tightly, grinning and crying at the same time from all the exertion. Papa. The most telling reaction, by far, was from Kokobil himself. The man's pride and arrogance had bled out of him completely, and he was staring wide-eyed at the newcomer. Why why you? He pointed a finger, positively trembling with fear. All semblance of bravado gone, the fallen could only look in shock as he desperately tried to gain his composure. The man who had appeared was a tall man who looked to be in his mid-twenties, with a muscular build to emphasize speed over strength. He had spiky crimson hair, sparkling azure eyes, and three faint whisker-like marks on his cheeks. He was wearing a formal black suit. Why are you here, Naruto Gremory? Kokobil shouted, trying to appear strong, have you come to be cut down by me as well? Naruto simply looked at him, looked hard. Kokobil started sweating in nervousness, fearing his response. The redhead simply ignored the fallen and made a beeline straight for Rias and the others. Reaching the downed kids, he was immediately tackled in a flying glomp by three multicolored blurs. He looked down to see Kuroka, Cheyenne, and Rias hugging him tightly, sobbing into his chest. Even Akano joined the group hug with a smile. I thought I was going to die. Cheyenne wept as she clutched his suit tightly. You saved us, NYA. Kuroka said as she, too, hugged Naruto. Foolish. Kokobil shouted as he readied an attack, but he found Naruto looking at him over his shoulder. One of the redhead's eyes was deep crimson with a slitted pupil, and it looked wrong. Kokobil found himself rooted to his place in fear, unable to move a muscle. Such power, to freeze me with but a glance. Naruto looked at his daughter, who was hugging him but looking away from him. Gently tilting her head to face him, Rias still averted her eyes. Rias-chan, look at me. His fatherly tone only served to bring more tears to Rias' eyes. She was disappointed in herself. 
she had failed to protect those who were precious to her and had to rely on her father to bail her out, again. She was a failure, she didn't deserve to be the heiress. I'm sorry, papa, she cried as she clung onto him for dear life, I couldn't beat him, I couldn't protect everyone. Rias bowed her head in shame. She was a failure, a disappointment. She had trained so hard, sacrificed so much, yet she still couldn't protect her family with her own power. If her father hadn't appeared when he did, they all would have died. She was snapped out of her thoughts when she felt a hand pat her head. She looked up to see her father smiling softly at her. You did well, sweetie. I'm proud of you. The simple words brought immense happiness and relief to the young girl's mind as she bit her lip to quell the fresh tears that had started falling. You sit back and relax, okay? Let your father take care of this one. Naruto grinned, poking Rhea's forehead. The girl weakly nodded and went towards her peerage to recuperate. Naruto turned to where Kokobil was flying, and his smile turned into a snarl. The fallen flinched at the sheer rage emanating from the redhead until he felt it. Death Kokobil froze in midair as the overwhelming presence of dread washed over him. He had only felt such intense bloodlust once in his life before, when he had faced this very man in combat. This killing intent, overwhelming, the spectators, who were all children, had dropped to the ground from the sheer weight of the pressure, even though it wasn't directed at them. W who is that guy? Saji shouted, trembling in shock. Sona pushed up her glasses and looked at him, sweating mildly from the pressure. That guy, as you crudely referred to him, is Rhea's father. Lord Naruto Gremory, the head of the Gremory clan, she said, making her pawn pale in fright. But why is Kokobil so scared of him? Lord Gremory is the most powerful devil in the world. Zenevere cut in. As an exorcist, it was her duty to be familiar with key figures of each faction. And Lord Gremory was one of the most famous. He can defeat Kokobil with ease. Wait. The most powerful devil. Asia shyly said, then why isn't he Amaru? That. I do not know. Akano glanced at Rias, who was looking away in embarrassment. Baku. Rias looked at the group with a red face. He's not leading because he wants to spend his life traveling the world with my mother and eat every kind of ramen in existence, she mumbled, burying her face in her hands. For all the power her father held, his reason for not leading the underworld was lame. Very lame. B but he advises the Maru from time to time. She retorted weakly, trying to save face. While this conversation was taking place, Naruto was having one of his own. So, Kokobil, he drawled, picking at his nails. Why are you doing this? Kokobil went on a long tirade about the glorious war, but Naruto was somewhere else mentally. Finally, a decent fight. Kurama roared in his mind. Years of your ramen tours and cutesy talks with your wife have made me sick. He grinned menacingly. Naruto just gave the fox a flat look. I could always summon you out, Yano. You could go play with the dragons in the mountains. He clapped his hands gleefully. As if. Kurama scoffed, those lizards are weak. And you think this guy is strong? Well thought so. How insufferable. Even when you reincarnated, I am stuck with you. Kurama huffed. I've grown bored after centuries of peace. Hey, look on the bright side, at least I got red hair this time. Naruto boasted as he ran a hand through his magnificent crimson locks. What an imbecile. Naruto just ignored his tenant and focused on the fallen, who was still mid-rant. He stared blankly at him and then shouted. Hey, idiot. Kokobil balked at the crude statement and looked fit to retort but then remembered who was speaking. W what? You made two mistakes, yeah no. Then Naruto vanished in a flash, leaving the spectators to look around wildly. Naruto appeared behind Kokobil, with a punch aimed at his face. Mistake one you attacked my kids. The blow connected with the weight of a falling star and Kokobil had no room to dodge. He was sent crashing down to the earth, where a huge explosion accompanied his arrival. He tried to get up but Naruto was upon him again, his foot on Kokobil's back. Oof. He struggled, unable to move. He looked up at Naruto, who was glaring down at him. And mistake too your timing could not possibly be any worse. Naruto hissed angrily. You know what I was doing before Rias called me? Naruto asked, only to receive no reply from the scared fallen. Do you? He thundered, making the poor fallen shake his head meekly. I'll tell ya. Naruto then cupped his cheeks dramatically, swaying from side to side. My darling Vina-chan had made ramen for me. He trailed off, a bit of drool escaping from his lips. Then his expression turned murderous again. My beautiful, amazing wife had made special homemade ramen with her own hands. Naruto stomped his foot down, making Kokobil's spine crack. For me, another stomp, another cry of pain. And you're the reason it's all cold now. 
Naruto stomped his foot again, confusing Kokobil a lot, even in his state of excruciating pain. The spectators had different reactions. What? Subaki muttered, not entirely understanding the situation. He's screwed. Ria's entire peerage deadpanned simultaneously. Naruto looked at the downed Kokobil underneath his foot. Akabil, he began, causing some of the kids to giggle, I was planning on flexing a bit since the kids are here, ya yeah, no. Naruto then materialized a truth-seeking orb and smashed it downwards. But you're not worth it. Kurama will have to sit this one out. He whispered coldly as the fallen angel disintegrated before his eyes. The spectacle was observed by the devils, shocking them tremendously. Sona looked wide-eyed and turned to Rias. He destroyed Kokobil in an instant. What technique was that? Her thirst for knowledge was acting up, eyes practically sparkling in excitement. Such power, such destruction, she gushed, breaking her composure momentarily. Rias just stuck her tongue out at her friend. Secret, she smirked. Spoil sport. Sona grumbled as she looked away. Saji just gulped and stepped back, glad that this monster hadn't heard his earlier disrespect. By then, Kokobil was done away with, and Naruto turned to the devil kids. With a grin and a cheery wave, he greeted them. Yo, the Gremory peerage and Naruto were sitting in the orc room two hours after the incident. Since it was all sanctioned, there had been no legal complications to speak of. They had repaired the school, and the exorcists had gone off to report to their superiors. Naruto was sitting on the couch next to Shion, petting her head as she slept. The kids were all exhausted, and Shion and Gasper had conked out, being the smallest of them. Naruto-sama, would you like some tea? Akano chirped from beside him, kettle in hand. Yep. Naruto blew on it tenderly as he drank the tea, eyes widening at the flavor. This is amazing, Akano-chan. He patted her head as well, making her sputter in embarrassment. N.A. Naruto-sama, the normally elegant queen squeaked with a red face. What? Naruto grinned cheekily, you kids are just so cute, ya no. He stroked Shion's hair softly, making her purr in her sleep. Adorable. He enjoyed teasing the children immensely. Before Akano could be further embarrassed, a jealous Rias cut in. Papa. Yes. Rias-chan. Naruto looked at her, smiling. Um. Well. She trailed off, unsure of what to say. She had just interrupted to get his attention but had no plans on what to do with it. Otu-sama, are you coming to the open house? Kuroka asked from across the room, saving Rias. She was also lying down on a couch by herself. Of course. I wouldn't miss it for the world. Naruto pumped his fist in the air. I wonder what chaos everyone will cause together under one roof, ooh He giggled with gleaming eyes. I can't wait. Naruto grinned as he skipped about the halls of the Gremory estate. Why is that, dear? The woman next to him asked. She was a beautiful brunette with violet eyes, wearing a white sundress. She was Naruto's wife, Venelana Gremory. It's the kids' open house today. And, after thinking about it, Naruto deflated. And nothing. It's nothing special, but I still got all excited, ya know, he sulked. Venelana giggled demurely. I jest, husband. I very much adore that hyperactive nature of yours, after all. She batted her eyelashes at him. Naruto blushed as he straightened up, looking away from his wife. UHM. Well, he cleared his throat, I was going to gather everyone up to leave in about an hour. All right. I have some business to attend to. What will you do? What business? Naruto tilted his head. Venelana rolled her eyes at her husband's clueless nature. A new collection of gems and artifacts has arrived, I have to inspect them. Venelana had various businesses, which were highly profitable. Naruto didn't understand half of what she did but always encouraged her to follow her dreams. Naruto nodded. Can I come with you? Of course, it's a Gremory business after all. Naruto shook his head, confusing his wife. Nah, that's your business, Vina-chan, he grinned when she blushed slightly, you built it from the ground up and all the credit goes to you. I'm perfectly happy supporting you, ya no. Venelana was filled with pride and love at hearing those words. In the underworld, most devils would sell their own children off to other clans in a bid to gain more power. But her husband never cared about any of that. He had plenty of power and did not use it maliciously or selfishly. Any other lord would have seized control of their spouse's business already, making her little more than a glorified secretary while they took all the credit. She really lucked out with her husband. His selfless nature was one of the things she loved most about him. She lost herself in thought as she remembered the meeting which decided their future. Flashback, you two shall be wed for the alliance between the Bale and the Gremory. Venelana's world went white as she heard Zekram Bale speak. She had met Naruto once or twice before at gatherings, and he really wasn't a bad guy. But this, to be married off to someone without having a say in the matter. 
to spend centuries, her entire life, shackled to a single man. Even if Naruto was perfectly decent, Venelana hated how helpless she was. She was only 18, she didn't deserve this. No, Venelana, along with the Bale and Gremory clan members, stared at Naruto in shock. Had she heard him correctly? A faint bud of hope bloomed in her heart, but she dared not let it grow. Sekram narrowed his eyes at the redhead. Care to repeat yourself, boy? Are you deaf? I said I'm not marrying her, ya no. Naruto replied, making the elders balk at his boldness. Venelana giggled slightly at that, glad that no one heard her. They were too focused on Naruto. Sekram's power fled in anger as he got up from his seat. Power of destruction was radiating around him in a vicious miasma, making everyone around him tremble in fear. Even Venelana stepped back slightly, wanting to avoid his wrath. Naruto just closed his eyes and yawned. Is that it? He asked, rubbing his eyes groggily. Sekram raised his power even more as his face contorted in rage, making the walls crack from the sheer force. Venelana had trouble standing, while some of the older devils had started sweating from the pressure. Don't try too hard, old man. You'll shit your pants or something. Naruto barked, laughing at his own joke. He wasn't phased in the slightest of the show of strength. The elders looked fit to faint at the blatant disrespect, and Venelana hid her smile with her hand. He's a really interesting guy, he's cute too, now that I look closely. She thought with a slight blush. Sekram let up, seeing as he wasn't having an effect. Know your place, boy. You will do as I say. Yeah, right. Naruto guffaw, clutching his sides. Should I go to my room too, mama? The audacity. This upstart, who does he think he is? The enraged shouts of the elders reached Venelana's ears, making her nervous. While Zekram couldn't attack the Gremory air outright, he could undoubtedly make Naruto's life miserable. Such was the influence of the Bale clan. Zekram calmed himself and decided to change his approach. And why not, may I ask? Is she not appealing enough to you, he said, clearly goading Naruto into a trap. Venelana had mixed feelings about the question. She would be free, but only because he found her unattractive. The thought left a sinking feeling in her stomach. She's very pretty, but that's not the point, Naruto replied without thinking, making Venelana's eyes widen. The point is that both of us should have a choice in who we want to marry, simple as that. This just reaffirmed her growing respect for the redhead in front of her. Sekram wasn't deterred. The power he would gain from this marriage was almost making him salivate, and he wouldn't part with it so quickly. You have no choice, he whispered coldly, at the end of his patience, you both are simply the tools of your clan to gain more influence. Your feelings don't matter, you are destined to be wed for the good of devil kind. It is your fate. Just like that, Zekram laid down the law. Whatever hope Venelana had gotten from the previous minutes was fast being lost again. The Bale clan was the most influential and powerful in the underworld, and one didn't disobey the great king like that. Just before she was about to resign herself to her fate, the atmosphere of the room turned chilly. Looking around, she found the source to be Naruto. He was grinning, but it was so very fake. His eyes had a certain gleam to them, which unsettled Venelana quite a bit. He he he. Naruto chuckled, which was far from a happy sound, old man. You just managed to cram all the wrong words into a single sentence, ya know? He pointed a finger at Zekram, who was looking back warily. Fate. Destiny. Tools. What difference does that make? I don't care about fate, he snapped, making the devils go on guard. Venelana was shocked, to say the least. This person was vastly different from the laid-back, happy Naruto she'd known. But she didn't interrupt, just stayed back and watched. I challenge you to a duel. One on one, I'll kick your wrinkly ass, believe it. And the rest was history. Suffice to say, when Naruto later asked her out, and she was free to decide, she happily gave him a chance. And it was the best decision of her life. Vina chan Naruto waved his hand in front of her head, snapping her out of her thoughts. You spaced out for a bit. Venelana shook her head, giving him a soft smile. Just remembering some fond memories, Naruto-kun. Oh. What? She merely poked his nose, making him blink. It's a secret. Moo. How mean. Naruto pouted and then changed the subject because it was boring. Let's go on a date after the open house. Venelana just wrapped her arm around his and leaned into his shoulder. Where would we go? Him. Naruto pondered as they kept walking, how about Paris? Or the moon. I could also ask Office Chan to take us to a nice, quiet dimension, he shot off the options in excitement. Venelana sweet dropped. Why did you pick such, extreme locations? Wouldn't any restaurant suffice? Although she didn't mind in the slightest. His ideas of activities were all very unique, and she enjoyed his plans immensely. Naruto just looked at her in shock. I'm not going to take my wife to some normal place, ya no. 
there has to be flair. He flailed his free hand dramatically to show her the seriousness of the situation. His wife sighed fondly and closed her eyes, being led along by her husband. Never change, dear, she whispered. She was glad that Naruto put so much effort into making her feel special, even centuries after being together. He indeed was an amazing husband. What was that? Nothing, nothing. She waved her hand, I'm looking forward to our date. Yeah, it'll be awesome, believe it. Yosh, are you ready? Naruto asked, getting a nod from his wife. Let's go then, he said as they were engulfed in a magic circle. They appeared in the orc room to be greeted by Rias and her peerage. Papa, Mama, Rias ran forward and glommed the duo, who happily returned her embrace. Naruto went to speak with the other kids while Venelana chatted with Rias. Yo, kids, Naruto-sama, Kiba bowed respectfully, only to grunt in surprise when he was pulled into a headlock by the redhead. Ea, Don't be so stiff, Yuto. Naruto ruffled his hair while not loosening his hold in the slightest. And what have I told you about the, Sama, hmm? You said not to, Kiba muttered while he tried to struggle out of the headlock. It was only for appearances, though, as a small smile could be seen on the blonde knight's face. It felt good to have a father figure he could rely on, but he was either too shy or too proud to say it out loud. Naruto released Kiba as Akino walked towards him, tea tray in hand. He just accepted it with a smile and sat down on the couch. Kuroko was sleeping next to him, snoring away contentedly. Naruto grinned and decided to prank her. The chance was simply too good to pass up. He leaned down and tickled one of Kuroko's fluffy ears, making them twitch slightly. She mumbled something incoherent and shifted in her sleep, but didn't wake up. Him, I need to amp it up, Naruto said, stroking his whisker marks. He then tickled both of her ears simultaneously, making them twitch and flutter even more. Nyahaha, Kuroko had started giggling in her sleep, much to the amusement of the room. Seeing as it still hadn't worked, Naruto went for his finishing move. He blew a puff of air directly into her ear. Here, yeah. Kuroko jolted awake with a squeak, only to find Naruto whistling innocently beside her. She narrowed her eyes at him, obviously used to his behavior. Dad, she rubbed the sleep out of her eyes before glaring at him. That was you, wasn't it? Naruto's whistling intensified. The most powerful shinobi, everyone. Kurama drawled sarcastically while clapping his paws slowly. Truly the paragon of excellence. Dad, Kuroko inched closer to Naruto, who was showing no signs of guilt. No idea what you're talking about, sweetie. Kuroka clearly didn't believe him and turned to the other occupants, while Naruto shook his head rapidly and held his hands in prayer. I didn't see anything, Kuroka. Akano smirked, getting a thankful nod from Naruto. Before she could question him further, another magic circle lit up in the room, and two people appeared from it. A tall man with rich crimson hair, and a stoic woman with silver hair dressed in a maid outfit. Venelana, who was standing beside Naruto, smiled at the newcomers. Hello Sirex, Graphia. Sirex Lucifer waved at his parents while Graphia offered a polite bow. Mom, Dad, it's nice to see you. Naruto walked behind Sirex and slapped him on the back, making him stagger slightly. How are ya, shrimp? Sirex sighed tiredly and rubbed his sore back. Dad, could you control your power a bit? You could have cracked my spine. He tried to reason, but Naruto merely waved it off and moved towards Graphia. The maid nodded and actually smiled, which surprised everyone in the room. Hello, father, she said, making Sirex pout. How unfair, he pointed a finger at Graphia, you call him father, but you always call me Lucifer-sama. She was undeterred, it is because he is not my superior, Lucifer-sama, and I have been asked to address him as such. She replied in a professional tone, although her voice conveyed warmth. Naruto was the first one after her husband, who had accepted her she had defected to the anti-Satan faction. He was one of the kindest and most trustworthy devils she'd met and it was due to his support that she had been accepted readily by the public. In addition to the respect she had for him, he had all but adopted her after becoming his daughter-in-law. Being from a strict servant clan, she was unfamiliar with the love of a parent to a large extent. Naruto and Venelana filled that void and made her feel at home. She was thankful to have the Grimeries in her life. But ow, Sirex was cut off as his cheek was pinched harshly by his irate wife. Venelana giggled slightly at the familiar sight of her son. I see you've not changed, Sirex. Sirex was about to reply until he saw a certain look in Graphia's eyes. It was accompanied by a tiny smirk, which spelt only trouble for him. Since his father had met her, he had resolved to shatter her cold persona and introduce her to the joys of pranking. He had succeeded splendidly. What can I say, mother? Graphia spoke up, her tone somber, he is always procrastinating and never does his work on time. 
She created a fake tear and wiped it away dramatically. I, as a maid, can only do so much, and I find myself at my wit's end. She sniffled for a bit, and it was so fake that Sirex was tempted to call her out. But he was not given a chance. Naruto appeared behind him and bonked the top of his head. You brat, how can you be so lazy? Naruto asked Sirex, who was nursing a comical lump on his head, you need to take your position seriously, Yano. Naruto went to Graythea and hugged her, having completely fallen for her prank. There, there, you don't have to worry anymore. He soothed while patting her head, I'll make sure he stays on top of his work, okay. And I can always give him some remedial training if he doesn't. Sirex's face paled at the mention of his father's training as he looked at his wife. She had a content expression on her face from having her head petted, but he could still see her evil smirk. It looked like he was the only one, as the other kids and his mom were all looking sadly at Graphia. Damn you, dad. He lamented inwardly, you even managed to turn my wife, the most professional person I've met, into a prankster. Thank you, father, Graphia said as she went to stand behind Sirex. Please take care of the matter. You bet. Sirex was getting tired of the teasing when he spotted someone he very much wanted to see. Rias was amused at the earlier interaction but now looked at him warily, having predicted the next course of events. She tried to leave the room but was too late. Little sis. The Gremory family were walking through the halls of Kuo Academy, and they were turning a lot of heads. It couldn't be helped. Each member of the family had almost a divine beauty to them, a kind of beauty humans simply weren't meant to attain. Naruto smiled and waved at the kids, which caused many boys and girls alike to swoon at his coolness. The rest of the adults merely offered polite smiles. Man, what are we supposed to do while the kids have their classes? Naruto grumbled as he walked alongside Venelana, I'm bored. Shall we go eat something? Venelana asked. She was getting rather tired of waiting herself. Yosh, let's see if they have ramen. Naruto declared as he started marching towards the cafeteria. Sirex and Graphia also left to explore the school on their own. Uncle, auntie, Naruto turned around and smiled at the owner of the voice. It was a young man accompanied by an older woman. Cyrog, Mizla, how's it going? Cyrog Bale walked up to his uncle's side with a smile. I'm doing well, uncle. Busy with my duties as the heir, he said, making Naruto nod. Cyrog was also in Rhea's class at Kuo, along with his queen. Cyrog Bale was the heir of the Bale clan, something which he had to struggle a lot to achieve. Since he did not possess the power of destruction, he and his mother had been shunned by the clan. Since then, he had resolved to train his body to its limits and prove that he could still be strong without his bloodline. Cyrog had visited the Gremory estate once, and his situation had reached Naruto's ears. He had since taken an interest in Cyrog and offered to train him. Naruto had been impressed by his determination, as it reminded him Rock Lee. It went without saying that when the most powerful devil, who also taught the four Maru how to fight, offered you training, one did not refuse. The training had been absolute hell, but he had gotten much stronger at the end of it. Oni Sama, Oni Sama. Mizla nodded and gave them a small smile, happy to see them after so long. When she had fallen into a coma, she had not expected to wake up. But she miraculously managed to recover, only to find her sister in law and her family in the room. They didn't know how she managed to pull through, but Naruto's cheeky wink and grin had told her all she needed to know. Also, when he learned about their whole story, Naruto promptly beat the snot out of this generation's Lord Bale as well. Naruto beating up Bale Lord seemed like a tradition at this point, as even Cyrog had gotten beaten to a pulp during training. All these formal people. Ah. Naruto pulled at his hair in distress, Vina-chan. I'm living in the mountains, bye, he nodded determinedly, pointing into the distance, probably at some mountains. No one listens to me, ya no. How will you get ramen then, dear? Mountain plan cancelled. To the cafe. Naruto turned around mechanically and stormed off with a red face, ignoring his wife and sisters giggling. I see Oni Sama is still as lively as ever. Venelana rolled her eyes. You have no idea. After having their lunch, Naruto and Venelana were roaming around the school when they heard large groups of students heading towards the gym. Having nothing better to do, they followed. Upon seeing what the commotion was, Naruto palmed his face. Honestly, this girl, Venelana simply watched on, amused. On the stage was Seraphal Leviathan, dressed in a pink magical girl costume. She was waving around her staff and striking poses from her show, much to the delight of the audience. Upon seeing Naruto and Venelana, her eyes widened as a grin burst on her face. Sensei, Naruto nimbly moved to the side to dodge a flying Seraphal and grabbed her mid-flight by the scruff of her neck. Hello? Seraphal, what's all this? He gave her a flat look, holding her up like a child. Seraphal sheepishly chuckled as Naruto let her down. I'm doing a magical girl meet and greet. 
She winked at him and held up a peace sign. I also came to see So Tan. Naruto smiled softly and patted her on the head, as she was much shorter than him. It's nice to see you, Sara. You look very magical today. He joked. Hee hee. Seraphel happily leaned her head into his palm, like a content kitten. She could always be herself when she was around her teacher. Since her younger years, Seraphel had been constantly told to, grow up, and, act like an heiress, which only increased after she became a Maru. But Naruto never ridiculed her for being childish or immature. It might be because he was just as immature as her with his prankster attitude, but the sentiment remained. Leviathan Sama, please act as per your position. A cold voice spoke, belonging to Graphia. She and Cyrex had entered the room, and her face was even more stoic than it usually was. Seraphal understood what was going on and smirked evilly. Oh, but Sensei was merely showing his favorite student some affection, isn't that right, Sensei? She gave Naruto the most adorable puppy eyes ever and relished in how Graphia's face tightened. Naruto completely missed the point, dense as he was. Of course, it's been so long since I've seen her. He grinned while Graphia clenched her teeth. It was another unspoken rivalry between her and Seraphal. They already were powerful devils with ice magic, but one was Naruto's student while the other was his daughter-in-law. They knew that Naruto didn't discriminate between them and that it was a ridiculous thing to fight over, but that wasn't how rivalries worked, was it? Father, please follow proper decorum in a public space. This was the most she could say without breaching her maid etiquette. She did enjoy that Seraphal couldn't call him, father, and had to settle for, sensei. Hi hi, Naruto rolled his eyes and withdrew his hand, making Seraphal pout. Seraphal pointed a finger at Graphia accusingly. You're just jealous that he's not patting your head, aren't you? She grinned impishly when the maid's face went slightly pink. H how uncouth, I thought no such thing. She coughed, trying to regain composure. Liar, I am not, girls. No fighting. Naruto appeared between the two women, who were almost nose to nose by now, with lightning shooting between them. Why can't you two just get along, ya no. The both of them looked at each other, then at Naruto, then, H emphed, and looked away. Seraphal stuck her tongue out at Graphia, who did not dignify that with a response. The hell was that, idiot. Kurama jabbed, he wouldn't miss a chance to insult Naruto. Shut it, man. Who are these people? They're all so weird. The students' voices reached the devils, and Venelana quickly used magic to wipe their memories of the past few minutes and send them on their way. Stupid Sharingan copy. Stupid Sharingan copy. Naruto and Kurama lamented simultaneously. He was still a bit salty about how everyone had memory and influence magic to some extent in this world. Ha. Huh. I remember you being so smug when you wiped the memories of a human for the first time. You thought you were the only one who could do it. Take that, Sasuke. You said, ha. Huh. I didn't pay attention to my tutors, okay. For his own mental health, Naruto ignored Kurama's uproarious laughter and focused on the present. So Tan, Seraphal glomped Sona, who had entered along with Rias and their peerages. I missed you, did you miss your big sis, she tightened her hold on her sister for safety. Only Sama, please don't embarrass me in front of everyone, Sona sighed as she rubbed her forehead in irritation. It's nice to see you too. While their sisterly bonding was going on, Naruto turned to Saji, who had immediately gone on high alert. He still remembered their first encounter and had no desire to get on this monster's bad side. And who might you be, young man? Ji Jenshu Saji, sir. Saji stuttered and ended his introduction with a salute at the end. He was trembling a bit from just standing in Naruto's presence. No need to be scared, ya no. Naruto eased his worries with a smile, I'm Naruto. Naruto held out a hand, which Saji tentatively shook, you're the only one from Sona-chan's peerage I've yet to meet, so I thought I'd say hi. Saji looked at the redhead in a new light. For all his power, Naruto appeared to be a surprisingly friendly person. Maybe there was no reason to be wary of the man after all. Naruto went towards Seraphal, who was still sticking to Sona like a leech. Let her breathe, Sarah. The poor girl looks like a tomato. He gestured to Sona, who had gone red from the crushing hug. Seraphal did so and immediately got into another fight with Graphia over who had, cooler ice magic. Naruto watched the various groups bicker and chat with a faraway look, lost in thought. This life isn't so bad after all. Isn't it, Kurama? Him. I'm still bored. Kurama denied, but his voice was warmer than one would expect from a Bayou. But I suppose it could be a lot worse. Naruto just laughed, glad that Kurama approved, in his own roundabout way.